I'm going to be talking about the results of a historic England Commission project completed at Trenton Peak Archaeology. We're based in Nottingham. Um, the title of the project is Enhancing the Paleo Channel Database of the Trent Catchment colon a Nottinghamshire pilot study, um, but I'm going to call it Paleo Channels Project from now on, I think, for obvious reasons. Um, the project was conducted by myself, uh, Samantha Stein, Steve Malone at Trenton Peak, and David Knight, um, with some input from Andy Howard of Landscape Research and Management. Um, we started the project in uh, November of 2014 and have so far completed Nottinghamshire um, in July of this year. The project aims to evaluate the paleo channel record of the entirety of the Trent catchment in Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire, Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Staffordshire, um, being completed in stages by county. Um, but since we're just at the end of the first pilot stage, I'm only going to be discussing Nottinghamshire today. Yeah, because there's nothing else to talk about. Yeah. Um, so, just to go through what I'm going to talk about with a nice picture of Repton and a paleo channel running along the bottom of the ridge that it's sitting on. Uh, talk about the background and main aims, um, very briefly deep into the briefly dip into the methodology used, um, and finally talk about the outputs and the implications they have on past and future climate change, and how these outputs uh, can reflect on the archaeological landscape and on the present and future archaeological resource management. And finally, hopefully we'll have some time that I can lure you in with a fascinating case study that I might get excited and jump about, but hopefully not too much because I'll maybe get out of the camera for a little bit. Um, so in case you're not familiar, uh, the Trent is the second longest river in the UK and its catchment covers much of the English Midlands. Um, all of Nottinghamshire is covered by only the Trent catchment. Um, that's not always the case, but that's a different story, different paper, different time. Um, everything in Nottinghamshire eventually drains into the Trent and then out into the Humber, or straight from the um, So. Uh, the Trent Valley itself formed the end of the Pleistocene, a large amount of water and sediment through the Midlands created a braided channel environment, like this one in Alaska, a little bit more exotic for you. Um, and the last deposition of the Trent Valley Terra sequence is what we see the Trent running through today. A uh, decreased outwash in the Holocene permitted the formation of a single meandering channel, um, but that's not quite, quite the end of the story. Uh, alluvial processes throughout the Holocene have deposited paleoenvironmental and landscape record of the Trent Valley and catchment. And uh, this record remains in the form of alluvial sedimentation and landforms such as paleo channels. Um, paleo channels provide a terrific twofold resource. Well, I'm going to get both of these categories in rivers and peat, and peat and rivers, so everybody has something to enjoy. Uh, they have sediments that contain paleo environmental evidence, such as insects, pollen, everything squishy and good that comes in them. Um, and they also, on a macro scale, create, um, contain evidence of prior landscape formations and can indirectly inform the archaeological record. Um, they're also great in this form because they can be seen on the surface and so can be identified using non-invasive remote visual inspection techniques. Um, unfortunately, it's quickly disappearing for a few reasons that we'll talk about. Um, one of them being groundwork, especially gravel extraction throughout the entirety of the catchment. Um, and indeed much has already been lost due to not having systematic archaeological recording in the early parts of the 20th century. Um, now the paleo channel record is also threatened by climate change, um, which will have many detrimental effects on the landscape record. These effects include desiccation of waterlogged deposits, permanent landscape flooding, or worst of all, complete erosion and disappearance of the paleo channel record. So, the main aim of this project is to identify, map, and catalogue the present paleo channel resource of the Trent catchment, that is the Trent and all its tributaries, uh, using a range of remote sensing techniques, including LIDAR, aerial photographs, historic maps, and multispectral data. Uh, and here we can see the Trent in full flood. Uh, quite daunting when you're at the edge, it's, it's coming at you, in tidal way. Um, earlier attempts to capture the paleo environmental record were completed by Steve Baker in 1998, as well as Steve Malone. Um, with us today, but this report only evaluated aerial photographs, um, so the introduction of freely available LIDAR for research purposes has vastly opened up our options for capturing this resource in this database. Um, so as I said, we're using um, LIDAR, we've mostly used one and two meter resolution as that's what's available by the Environment Agency, and we're fortunate enough to be working in river valleys, which is what the Environment Agency is interested in. So we've got um, a very valuable resource in LIDAR because almost everything that we're looking at has been covered. 
Uh, we also use first edition OS maps, aerial photographs taken after 2000, as all the pre-2000 photographs were looked at by Baker, um, and some multispectral data, but today I'm just going to be talking about LiDAR because let's face it, it's pretty, pretty when you look at it. So none of these methods are 100% effective. Uh, they can be affected by time of view, ground saturation, camera angle, time of map drawing, light direction, and good old human error. That would be probably my error, hopefully not. Um, so all of those things can affect um, the effectiveness. So by reviewing multiple sources, it is hoped that some of this error is significantly reduced. So we looked at a total of 1,300 square kilometers of LiDAR data. Um, looking mostly at topographic color scales as well as hill shaded data. Um, and it's approximately 60% of the county that's covered by the Trent catchment. Um, so that's all the LIDAR that we carefully combed over <laughs> meter by meter. It was a lot of fun, I promise. Um, all of the formations are recorded in a GIS shapefile where they were categorized by how they were manifested on the available map cataloged by one of these categories. Um, Although all of these categories appeared in the database, um, depressions and ridge and swale were generally the most common on the LIDAR, depending on where you were in the river system. So here's a quick example of a single meander of a depression near Kettlethorpe in Lincolnshire. Yes, all right, that's not in Nottinghamshire, but never mind that. Um, and some depressions, but also that appear as a sort of ridge and swale, ridge and swale being um, the formation of small bridges and depressions associated with the movement of a meander, which deposits and erodes materials throughout the process. Now this is Barton and Fabus, um, and a bit more ridge and swale, or Carlton on Trent. So, where are we at? Um, the final product of the project is a formal, um, searchable, geo-referenced and transferable record of the paleotonal resources in the Trent catchment. Uh, we revealed a total of 2,655 paleo channels within the Trent catchment of Nottinghamshire, with 1,682 in the Trent Valley alone. Um, the methodology adopted has resulted in a considerable increase of the recorded features since 1998, uh, somewhere in the order of 560%. Um, so that's great, we've got numbers, we've got maps, but how are we going to use this to understand climate change and the landscape? Um, see. What's next? So here's that's just the paleo channels recorded in black, <laughs> so it's quite a large area of them. Um, paleo channel record is mainly intended to be used for interpretation of past, present, and future Trent catchment landscape. In archaeology, it can also be used, for example, to <coughs> identify areas where paleo environmental evidence may be located in the form of waterlogged sediments. These sediments may also yield dating information, which is, of course, very valuable and adds an extra dimension to the resource. Um, archaeologists and in the form of developing archaeological plans uh, will also have an idea of the location of such waterlogged archaeology and can plan recording according to the prior to excavations. Uh, that why it looks terrifying. Um, so here's an example of a paleo channel being investigated during the um, during gravel extraction. Um, and fortunately that one did get recorded, a lot of them don't, they get kind of taken out before any samples can be taken. Um, and then eventually they look like this, so there's not any record of the channel there anymore, it's just a lake. Which is very nice for boating and things, <laughs> um, but it's probably not 10 minutes anymore, is it? Because you've probably been waving it for a long time. <laughs> 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 so we can also get an idea of um, the presence of paleo channels in urban contexts. Although they don't appear in the same detail as less developed areas, depressions picked up through LIDAR make it possible to detect paleo channels within these areas. Um, so here we have a case of Nottingham, where everything is built up, um, and you do get a general idea based on topography, but the LIDAR has really brought it out that actually there's a quite distinct depression around the canal, so that canal probably actually follows the line of a paleo channel. Um, and you've got a few other areas that I wouldn't want to live in, so I think I'll have a look, have a look at this map before buying in Nottingham. <laughs> uh, we also get the chance to see the different ways that paleo channels are recorded on these different data sets, as I said, I'll bring in a few of the others, um, and we can see that crop rotations, uh, plowing techniques all have different um, effects 
on how these are recorded. So in red, these are recorded on LiDAR, and in white, they're recorded on aerial photographs. Um, and you can see the aerial photographs often cut out um, because of different crops being present at different times. Um, yeah. So I have got time for a case study to be a bit more in depth. Um, hopefully, I won't jump around too much. So you have to move the camera a lot already. Um, so just to demonstrate the value of the Paleo Channel resource and why it's important to record, um, we're going to examine a multi-period site on the banks of the Lower Trent at Littleborough. Um, I had a look at it during my PhD, and I know Steve's had a lot of looks at it as well. Um, but I didn't really get a chance to truly understand the effects of past climate change and the implication that it has for future climate change um, until I actually recorded these paleo channels and had a very close look at the record. Um, this is not Littleborough, but this is just up the river. Um, it's a deserted medieval village with a 19th century um, graveyard, and the church has since fallen down. Uh, and the paleo channel, the trend used to run just below this ridge and has since moved to the other side so we can actually see. Uh, people settling on the trend and the trend moving, the landscape looks completely different. But by knowing what the Paleo Channel resource is, we can interpret that archaeology. But moving on to the real case study, actually. Uh, they're all interesting, I can't stop myself. Um, so the site of Littlebridge is located on the west bank of the present trend. The settlement known to the Romans as Subgelicum was on the Roman road between Lincoln and Doncaster within the lower lying ground on the first terrace of the trend. Um, and you can probably see here, maybe you can't because I. This is probably not safe. Um, it's lying on a small patch of gravel. Um, as I said before, it's on a braided, um, braided channel terrace. So this being a patch of gravel that's left over from that glacial outwash. Um, um, so the island is left peaking above the low wetlands of the Trent. Channel shifting demonstrated by paleo channel locations, as we'll see, provide evidence of the effects of climate change on the archaeology at Little Brown in the past two millennia. What are you? Oh, yes. Uh, Roman Little Brown, always known to be at this location, was recorded in detail by aerial photography in the 1980s. It was subject to excavation at the same time, which demonstrated that the extensive settlement was spread across the entirety of the larger island, and the lower parts of the island were included. So that's, that's, higher, that's a higher bit. And then that was that lower part of the of the island. Well, it does not like that. There you go. So the higher bit in green, and then the lower bit in yellowish, bluish, bluish green. Um, excavations uh, demonstrated that all the Roman features were filled with waterlogged organic and alluvial deposits, which date to the third century, well, end of the second, beginning of the third century. Um, the accumulation of organic deposits within Roman settlement features occurs in several sites along the Trent, such as, such as at Rampton uh, and at other locations um, in Sturton the Seafall, as well as places further up um, the lower trench near Stunthorpe. Uh, it's probable that rising water levels associated with deteriorating climate at the end of the Roman period forced settlement sites to shrink and move on to higher ground where it currently still stands. Um, but all we have had. Um, as of these excavations is some peat and some negative features. So presently, the, settled, the site is a small nucleated hamlet along the highest point of the gravel terrace. At the top of the high ground there uh, is a medieval church with Saxon construction with post-medieval buildings across the present settlement. The site has actively has had activity on it throughout the early medieval, medieval and post-medieval periods. Um, and it is suspected that Bede visited the settlement in the 8th century, uh, and a ferry, although we're not sure if it's continuous use, um, was at least in use during the medieval period and the post-medieval period up until the 19th century. Um, although there is no evidence that the site actually went outside the bounds of the present site onto that lower bit of ground any time mm -hmm. after the Roman period. Um, just a quick look at this map um, of 1722. Um, was recorded because it was known that the site was there. You can see the old road to Danham, which is Doncaster, and the ferry over here in 1722. Uh, and we've also got the Trent to the east, and then we've got Mother Drain in the west with a tiny little bridge with tree lines following it, um, and lots of post-medieval farm plots there. 
there's Mother Drain today. That's that one with the bridge on the west. So based on this evidence alone, there is a glimpse of the effects of climate change, but by reviewing the paleo channels recorded on LIDAR during the paleo channels project, the wider implication of the change becomes very evident. Uh, paleo channels demonstrates that the drainage system that currently is in place were placed there as a result of paleo channels that once ran through the area. It also demonstrates that past climate change forced settlement shift and created a whole, um, a unique archaeological preservation at the same time, uh, the preservation being organic remains in negative pictures. Um, so, yeah, okay, look at one. Um, so we can see here by flooding in the 1940s, we'll just let you sit, sit that one in. Uh, the paleo channels all around both the earlier larger Roman settlement and later smaller medieval settlement of Littlebrook demonstrate that the site would have been very different islands during both periods. During the Roman settlement being similar to today with dry fields across where the buildings were, well, I hope they would be dry where they put their buildings, um, with a bridge connecting the site with the west um, across Mother Drain. Uh, and in the early medieval period, with rising water levels regularly covering the Roman settlement, during frequent floods, the site may have appeared closer to how it looks when the trench is in full flood. Um, so that would mean that more than just a bridge would be required to get anywhere off of Little Bro in any time during any flood. Um, possibly a boat or two. Um, so these paleo channels and archaeological building evidence demonstrate the effects of climate change on settlement in the area in the past 2,000 years. Um, and uh, the project has also highlighted several other areas. Uh, there's the paleo channels that are recorded around Little Bro um, from the project. And we can see all the areas that would have been regularly flooded um, during periods of high water level. Um, the project has also highlighted that Little Bro is not unique. There are many gravel island sites throughout the Trent that probably have just interesting, just as interesting of information, perhaps not an established Roman settlement like we have at Little Bro, but as you can see, they're dotted throughout the braided channel system, which rising water levels will flood. Uh, if, if, uh, they will flood around these gravel islands, um, so we can see the changes that climate change will have on the archaeological landscape. So, just to go back to paleo channels, uh, once complete, the resource will be freely available to use, and it is our hopes that it will can help to inform future archaeological work, not only of what is currently on the ground, but also of all paleo channels that will be quarried away, dug out, or destroyed through future natural processes. Uh, I hope you'll have a look at our project once it's available, and keep an eye out for forthcoming results for other projects we already have um, in the works that resulted from all of these results from Nottinghamshire paleo channels. Thank you, maybe. That's the channels on it. There we go. Yeah.